Great. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Elbow Lake Environmental Education Center's virtual presentation on how you can start identifying winter birds and participate in Project Future Watch. My name is Megan, and I'm one of the outreach and teaching interns here at the Queen's University Biological Station, also known as CUBES. And my name is Lindsay, and I'm the other outreach and teaching intern. Before we jump in, I just wanted to note that this video is not sponsored by Project Feeder Watch, um, and Lindsay and I are just two students that are excited about birding and want to share our excitement about winter birding with you all. If you have any questions, please feel free to check out Elbow Lake's website um, and social media and the YouTube description at the end of this presentation, but we can get started. So for today's virtual presentation, we'll be discussing Project Feeder Watch and how to get involved. After that, we'll jump into some tips about how to set up a bird feeder and what to put in it. And then we'll discuss some common Kingston birds to give you an idea of what birds you might see at a bird feeder and how to identify them. We'll then end with some next steps that you can tell your friends and family about um, to help spot local winter birds. So as Megan said, we will begin by discussing Project Feeder Watch. So Project Feeder Watch is a citizen science survey of birds in Canada and the United States where participants of all ages take notes on how many birds and what birds they observe in their yards, either at a bird feeder or not at a bird feeder. So this survey runs from November to April every year, and all you need to do is sign up on Project Feeder Watch's website, and then they will send you guides and instructional materials. Then all you need to do is count your birds that you see in your yard for as long as you like on the days that you like, and then enter these counts online or on their mobile app. And so these counts allow you to track what is happening to birds around your home and contribute to a continental data set of bird distribution and abundance. Project Feeder Watch is operated by the Cornell Lab of Orthonology and Birds Canada and is supported almost entirely by its participants. Thus, Canadians are asked to make a donation of an amount of their choosing to participate. And even though this program is called Feeder Watch, we did want to emphasize that you don't need a bird feeder to participate in the bird count. All you need is an area with plantings, habitat, water, or food that attracts birds. So what happens to citizen data that is submitted to Project Feeder Watch, and why is counting birds so important? Well, first, Feeder Watch data are important because they provide information about bird population biology that cannot be detected by any other available method. Scientists can't be everywhere at once, um, but you can, and so our data is very helpful for them. And so Feeder Watch data shows which bird species visit feeders at thousands of locations across the continent every winter. The data also indicate how many individuals of each species are seen, and this information can be used to measure changes in the winter ranges and abundances of bird species over time. Feeder Watch data tell us where birds are, as well as where they are not, which is equally as important. And so this information is crucial and enables scientists to piece together the most accurate population maps. Lastly, Project Feeder Watch is a fun, low-cost activity that participants of all ages, skill levels, and backgrounds can enjoy, including children, families, individuals, classrooms, retired people, youth groups, nature centers, and bird clubs, so everyone can participate. So now we'll be talking a little bit about bird feeders, um, what they are and what seeds to put in them. Um, so there are a variety of different bird feeders and many different bird feeders are different for different species of birds. The most common bird feeder, so what you think of when you think of a bird feeder is probably the large tube, um, which is just in the top right of the screen. Um, but again, as mentioned, to participate in Project Feeder Watch, you don't actually need a feeder, but sometimes it can be helpful. And if you want to learn more, you can go to Project Feeder Watch's website, and that should be linked in the description of this video. Um, first, we have our feeder, which is just the ground. A lot of birds prefer larger and flat surfaces when they're feeding. Um, so song sparrows and towhees would be examples of those. And so just using the ground and laying seeds out on the ground can be helpful for them. Next, we have the suet cage, and so that holds suet seeds. Um, you can also use an onion bag if you don't have access to this cage, and this attracts birds like woodpeckers and nuthatches. Um, you again, you have your tube feeders, which are more common. You've got the large one as well as the smaller one. The different sizes will attract different sizes of birds. Again, the larger feeder for larger birds. Um, the tube cages or tube feeders can be quite helpful because they help keep the seeds dry. As you can see, there's kind of the lid on top of it. Um, next, we have the platform bird feeder. And so if you're using a platform, you just have to be careful to make sure that there's drainage holes because water can often accumulate um, through the sides of it. And platforms are good for most bird species. And then finally, we have the hopper bird feeder. And this has walls and a roof to protect the seed. It can also attract larger birds like grackles and doves. Um, and so if you want these smaller birds, just make sure you have a smaller opening um, to access the seed. 
there's also a large variety of different bird seed types. So again, if you want to look at Project Peter Watch, the website to find more information about which would be best for you. Um, but these are just some of the ones that are available. So we've got our black oil sunflower, and that is probably the most common because it's really high in energy, but it still has thin shells and so birds are able to eat it quite um, efficiently. Next we have corn. Um, so corn is pretty inexpensive. It can be used dried or unpopped, um, but just make sure that it's not seasoned in any way as that can be damaging to the birds. Um, and if you, if you want to attract smaller birds, you might have to crack the corn for them first. Then we have niger seeds. These are from the thistle plant, so they're also known as thistle seeds, and they often are quite popular for finches. Um, and they are small, so you'll have to be careful with what feeder you're using if you're using the seed. We also have peanuts. So again, just avoid salted or covered peanuts to any extent, but pe peanuts are legumes and they have a lot of protein in them, which can be good for the birds. You can also use fruit. Um, so things like oranges, grapes, raisins, um, or even dried seeds of fruit, fruit like pumpkins or apple seeds can be quite yummy. Um, but just make sure that any of your dried fruits don't have any preservatives in them. We also have the hulled sunflower seeds. So this is just the same as the black oil sunflower, but without the seeds. So the shell's already been taken off. Um, and then we also have mealworms. And so these are the larvae of a darkling beetle that are a really high protein treat. Um, so probably won't last too long at your feeders as they are quite delicious for many birds. And then finally, we have the sweat seeds. So that would be what's found in these sweat cages. These attract insect eating birds because they're made of beef kidney fat as well as other seeds and berries. And so again, high in protein um, and are be good, will be good for your aerial insectivores. Awesome, thanks Megan. So now that we've given an overview of different kinds of bird feeders and what birds eat, we're gonna move into identifying our local birds. And so in order to do that, we first need to have an understanding of the different features of birds that vary between species and allow us to identify them. So as many of you know, um, there are many different parts to a bird. And I know this seems kind of basic, but I promise you there is a reasoning behind this. Um, so you can identify a bird depending on what all of these individual features look like. And so all birds have two eyes, just like we do. They have a beak. They have two feet. They have two wings. They have feathers and a tail. And so we will talk a little bit about each part and the functions of each. So first we have the bird's eyes. And so most birds, um, like this pigeon here, have what's called monocular vision. And so what that means is that their eyes are located on the sides of their head. <laughs> I hope you can see me here. Um, their eyes are located on the sides of their head, um, which means that each eye is used separately to see things. And this is really beneficial because birds with monocular vision are able to see almost 360 degrees um, all the way around them. And that is very beneficial because if you are watching out for birds or other predators that might be hunting you, it will help you see them better. Um, on the other hand, some birds have what we call binocular vision, like this owl here, and which means that they have two eyes on the front of their head facing forward. And so humans actually have binocular vision too. That's why I'm going like this. <laughs> and so these birds um, can see out of both eyes at once, just like we can. However, um, the birds can't move their eyes around without moving their whole head like we can. Just kind of like how I can move my eyes to see side to side, um, but these owls can't. So they have to turn their whole head if they want to be able to see around them. But that being said, they can see very well in the direction that they're looking, which is very beneficial for them as they are hunters. And so they need to be able to see their prey really well, especially in lower light conditions. Moving on to the beak. And so the shape of a bird's beak is an important identification characteristic, and it also gives a clue for what they might be eating. And so some birds like the pileated woodpecker here on the left, the first one, they have beaks that look like a chisel and they use this to drill inside trees and eat insects. Others, like the purple finch, the second one from the left here, have short stubby beaks, which is helpful for them because they like to crack open and eat, and eat nuts. The third bird here, the red-tailed hawk, it has a beak you might be able to see that's kind of pointed at the end. Um, so this sharp hook is really beneficial because it allows them to kill and tear meat that they eat. And finally, the hummingbird here on the far right has a long thin beak that it uses to drink nectar from flowers. However, you might be thinking, Lindsay, I won't be seeing a hummingbird at my feeder in the winter because they migrate. Um, yes, you are correct. Uh, hummingbirds migrate to Central America and Mexico over the winter, 
but we did just want to mention their unique beak structure because we think it's pretty cool. Feet are quite important for birds as well. A bird's feet is also an indication of their lifestyle and how they like to get their food. So you can learn a lot from them. Um, and bird feet are used to walk around on the, on the ground, but they can also be helpful for birds holding onto trees or even swimming. Um, birds have strong legs and feet to hold, help them hold onto their branches and their toes are curved so they don't fall off. Some birds also have sharp, thick claws that allow them to catch and eat prey, which you can see with the raptor foot on the screen here and feathers. Now you know that all birds have feathers and feathers are really important for the bird to fly, but they also have other functions as well. Feathers keep the birds warm, especially during the cold winters. Um, they don't have winter coats that they can put on. And feathers are also used for display. So many birds have different colorful feathers, which helps them attract a mate. A bird's feathers are also important for camouflage and keeping them hidden from predators. And all of these feathers also help to make up their wings. So as you know, wings are quite important for flying. On the left, you can see a tree swallow. So tree swallows will catch insects while they are flying in the air. And so they have short agile wings that allow them to turn quickly to be able to get catch their prey. The bird in the middle is a bald eagle and they catch fish in the water. So they need to be able to tuck their wings in to dive down and catch their food. And then they need strong, large wings to lift them up and their food out of the water. Finally, the bird on the right is a turkey vulture. They have a huge wingspan of over six feet and they are scavengers and spend most of their day soaring in the sky looking for food. They save their energy by having large wings and so they can catch wind currents and hot air drafts and don't have to fling, flap their wings for minutes or hours. So just like all birds have wings, they do have special adaptations um, fit for their lifestyle. <clears throat> so now that we've gone over the anatomy of birds, let's get into the fun and ID some common Kingston winter birds. So to begin, um, we're gonna discuss three birds that look very similar. Um, but we will discuss the differences and how you can tell these three apart. So the first one that we have here is the white-breasted nuthatch. Like its name, this bird has a white stomach and it also has a white face. On top of its head is a black cap and you can think of it like a little hat. Um, and sometimes these birds have brown under their tails as well and you can kind of see it in the picture there kind of by its feet. And so what you may notice is that nuthatches are able to go head first down a tree or upside down and this helps them eat insects from inside the trees. Next, we have the red-breasted nuthatch, uh, which is a smaller relative of the white-breasted nuthatch. And you have probably guessed it, but this bird has an orangey red stomach instead of the white stomach. The red-breasted nuthatch also has a black cap on top of its head, just like the white-breasted nuthatch. But if you look closely, you can see that it also has a black stripe across its eyes as well, kind of like it's wearing an eye mask. And so the flight pattern of the red breasted nuthatch is short and bouncy. And this nuthatch also likes to grip upside down onto trees to eat insects from inside the tree. And thirdly, we have the black cap chickadee. And chickadees also have a black cap on top of their head, just like the nuthatches right here. Um, but if you look carefully, it has a black throat as well as white cheeks. So it doesn't have the eye mask. It has a black throat and white cheeks. Um, and its sides are brown and its stomach is white. And then its back is kind of a brownish gray color. And so chickadees make nests in rotting wood. Um, an example could be a dead tree. Chickadees also store their seeds in trees and they can remember thousands of hiding spots, unlike our squirrel friends. And the call of a chickadee sounds like their name. So it sounds like chickadee dee dee. And the number of D's that they use means a higher level of anxiety. So something maybe close that they think might eat them or hurt them. And so they will use more D's in their call to warn their family and friends that they should stay away. So before we move on, let's just take a quick minute to remember the differences between these three birds that we just talked about that look a lot alike. So the first thing that you can do is look at the markings on their heads. The black capped chickadee on the left has a black cap, just like its name, and a black throat, and its cheeks are white. The white breasted nut hatch, so the one in the middle here, just has a black cap on top of its head. It has no other black markings on either its cheeks or its throat. And then we have the red breasted nut hatch, where it has a black cap on top of its head and the black eye stripe. And then another key indicator might be the red-breasted nuthatch has a very brightly colored stomach. And finally, the nuthatches, both the white-breasted and the red-breasted, 
like to be upside down on trees, um, whereas the chickadee does not. So if you see a bird that is upside down on a tree, it is likely one of the nuthatches. I hope that helps. We also have the woodpeckers. And so we'll be talking about the hairy woodpecker and the downy woodpecker today. Um, but overall, woodpeckers use their large, strong beaks to eat insects and sap in tree trunks, um, hence their name. Hairy woodpeckers can be found on the ground all the way up to high altitudes in the mountains. And if you're looking for hairy woodpeckers, you want to try and spot the red spot on the back of their head. Um, but be aware these are only for males, so female woodpeckers don't have these. Um, woodpeckers have a long chisel-like beak, and they're similar in size to a blue jay. Downy woodpeckers is qu are quite similar to the hairy woodpeckers. The males also have a red spot, but their beak is much shorter and they're also smaller in size, um, only about six and a half inches tall, so much smaller than a blue jay, um, as well as the hairy woodpecker. If we were to look at both of them, um, to help tell them apart, you can look at their size as well as their beak. So let's start by looking at their beak. Um, the hairy woodpecker has a beak that is about two thirds the length of its head, so more than half the length of its head, while the downy woodpeckers um, beak is much shorter and it's only about half the length of its head. As well, the hairy woodpecker's body and tail is much larger than the downy woodpecker. Another bird that you might see at your yard in Kingston is the purple finch. However, as they are also in competition with similar birds like sparrows and other finches, um, this has unfortunately moved the purple finch a bit away from bird feeders and more into forested areas, but that doesn't mean that you won't see them. And so even though it is named the purple finch, this bird is more of a reddish rose color. It likes to forage for seeds and insects in trees and shrubs, hence its short and stubby beak. Here we have a common but elusive bird, the cardinal. Male cardinals are bright red, and this is to attract mates, and female cardinals are more of a brownish color, and this helps them stay more hidden from predators. Especially in the winter, that's a very beneficial feature. And so cardinals eat seeds, insects, and berries, hence the short stubby beak, just like the finch. And they also need a dense brush for nesting. And so if you're gonna see a cardinal at your feeder, just take note of whether or not you see the bright red cardinal or the more brownish, um, more brownish colored cardinal and that will likely help you out the most. Next, we have the American goldfinch. And these birds are really cool because the males and females are a brighter yellow in the spring and summer. Um, with the male still being a bit more brightly colored than the female to attract them. But when the colder weather comes, like around now, both males and females molt, which means that they lose and replace their feathers to become more of a dull beige color. And so that's what you'll see here in this photo. And so this molting takes place because it is smarter to be a dull color against the white winter snow rather than be very bright yellow, especially if you want to stay hidden from predators that might eat you. And like the other birds that we've talked about, the American goldfinch also has a short beak and only eats seeds. Last but not least, if you like baseball, you might know that this is a blue jay. Blue jays can take and eat eggs of other birds' nests, but most of the time they just eat insects and nuts. And so blue jays can mimic other birds, especially hawks, which is really cool. And so they make other birds think that there's this really big, scary hawk around them, even though it's actually just a blue jay, which is much smaller in comparison. And another really in cool, interesting fact about blue jays is that their blue feathers are a result of our eyes seeing scatter light reflecting off of their feathers. So what, what that means is that their feathers appear blue to us, even though the actual pigment in the feathers is brown. But who knew? Thanks for that explanation, Lindsay. I didn't know, so I appreciated learning that. Um, but now that you have kind of a rough idea about some of the different birds that you may see around the Kingston area and are wanting to do more um, with your newfound information, um, first and foremost, we would suggest you guys join Project Feeder Watch. This is a really, really valuable project um, and your observations can contribute to science and data globally, which is pretty exciting to be a part of. Um, also, if you're wanting to learn more about how to ID different birds, there is a common bird ID sheet on the Elbow Lake Environmental Education Center's website. There's a glimpse of it on the screen there that gives a couple more birds that you might see in your backyard. There's also more information about how to go birding um, and a Q&A with Dr. Lowheed also found on the YouTube. And there's also a variety of educational activities on the Project Feeder Watch website that cover a bunch of different topics from math and art and science and history all about birds and Project Feeder Watch. So all of these links should hopefully be in the description in the YouTube box below. Um, and that's all. Thanks so much for joining us today. And we can't wait to hear what birds you find.